Awesome. Well, good job. Congratulations, Wade. For those of you that may have just been coming a few weeks, I am the pastor. I just haven't been here to, uh, I haven't been around lately, so it's been, it's, it's good to be back, at least for my aspect of things. It's good to be back. I'm excited to be back. I'm looking forward to being here and to getting to, to preach and talk with you guys. It's been a month, and I, I, I miss it. I just miss getting to preach, and so... Thanks for everything that you do and, and everybody that's taking care of things. There has been so much go on. I wanted to make sure that I made a couple of announcements to, to recognize these things. Yesterday, Whitney Jones won the Hoop Shoot State Championship. Yeah. She sunk 23 out of 25 free throws. Yeah, she's, that was pretty awesome. And I was... Uh, I know that the high school coaches are excited about seeing her come in. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the girls basketball wanted to recognize them. They had such a great year and did such a great job. Congratulations, girls, on having such a great year. And then obviously our boys winning the other night, and they're still in it and still going, and so we celebrate that, yes. Also, last, uh, last week or maybe two weeks ago now, we had some middle school students that won the Pantex Science Bowl that are going on to Washington, D.C. Man, that's huge. That's awesome. Congratulations. There's been so much go on. Uh, I, I know we, we celebrated our, our cheerleaders that got to go to nationals, and there was some other big sporting event that happened the last few weeks. I know I'm forgetting about. I don't remember. Power lifters tore it up, and... Oh, yeah, Braden, my boy won, so it was good. <laughs> we have done some celebrating at my house. It has been awesome. And, uh, and I did write this, all my notes on this prayer request card, which we'd rather use them for your requests. So don't forget about those. If you have some requests, be sure and get those to us. And then i just really looking forward to getting into this. I, I felt like coming back that the Lord was going to you know, to, to give me a different kind of message, and I was looking forward to what I thought he was going to bring me, and, and then I got back and I encountered something different than what I was expecting to encounter, and I felt like the Lord said there are some issues across the board that have not been nailed down, and we need to nail these things down, and so we want to make sure we want everyone that, that belongs to this church, that goes to this church, to have some understanding about some issues. And so I didn't, I didn't feel God drawing me towards what I was expecting him to draw me towards. In fact, I got back and was, was surprised that I felt like he wanted me to come back and really talk about the subject of baptism. And as I mention that to you, and as I tell you that I'm going to be talking about the subject of baptism, those of you that have experienced baptism, those of you that, that may have, you know, done that years and years ago, I don't want you to disengage. I want you to stay plugged in because there is an element of baptism that we miss across the board. And that's what I felt like the Lord was, was stirring my heart about. And so... I felt like he said he wanted me to, to go in and to look at some scriptures in depth about baptism. The first places that we have to go in and look at about baptism are where Jesus was baptized. There are four different places that talk about the story of Jesus' baptism. If you have your Bibles and you want to look through them, great. If not, we're going to put, we've got several scriptures that we're going to put up on the board. And I want to put these up on the board and, and I want to, I want to take a little bit of time with this issue because I want us to understand. I, I, I really believe that the church has dissected things so much that when you, when you chop things down so into such small pieces so that people can try to take them in, often what happens, things start getting diluted. And I believe, I really and truly believe that the idea of baptism has been diluted by the church. And I think the Lord wants to bring some correction to that. And so that's what we're going after. First passage I want you to look at is in Matthew chapter 3. Let me say this too. I thought about this 
before I really get started. Some of you, I have to apologize. If I saw you this morning and I didn't, you know, and I acted strange, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a hugger kind of guy. I, I like that and shake hands and stuff. I have shingles and some of y'all that know more about shingles than me can come and, and uh, educate me here in a little bit and tell me, but everything I've read, it's not, it's not a contagious thing unless someone hasn't had chicken pox. And so I, am, I have not touched anybody this morning intentionally, and I don't want some of y'all to think, well, who was he? I didn't want you to think I was being rude, so I wanted to make sure I touched on that. Okay. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13. It says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. There's some, there's some, I'm, I'm going to just touch on this because I think I'm going to come back and pick it up. I've talked about this briefly before, but one, one side note I want to point, point at and show you. This is Jesus being baptized, which was, as John recognized, not a necessary thing. And it, and it wasn't a necessary thing as far as Jesus is standing with God. But what it was necessary for is for Jesus to be our example. He, he came and lived this life and, and exampled for us. And, and so that's the reason that he did this. But one thing, I, one side note I want to point out about this. John recognized as Jesus was walking up, I've got no business baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And, and the thing that's funny about that is you back up years before when John was still in his mother's womb. When Jesus' mother, Mary, Jesus was in her womb. When Mary walked into the room, the Bible says that Martha, that the baby inside of her, that John the Baptist inside of her, leapt inside of her womb. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was from the time he was still, he himself was inside his mother's womb and Jesus was inside inside his mother's womb. John the Baptist, here's my point. This is the side note that, that I'm, I want you to recognize because I want it to bring some, some uh, learning to us, but we're, I'm, I think I'm going to go back and touch on this later, deeper over the next few weeks. The thing I want you to see is this. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was from the very beginning of who he was. He knew Jesus in the womb, He knew Jesus later on, and as Jesus was walking towards him to be baptized, John said, do not ask me to do this. You should be baptizing me. John understood who Jesus was, and yet when John's life was on the line, he began to question. When John was in prison and he was fixing to have his head taken off, he sent word to Jesus' disciples to say, Hey, what's up with this? Are you who you said you are? I'm about to die here. What's the deal? And the reason I want to highlight that and show you that is this. John, just like you and I, walked through life. He was a real guy. And he struggled. And the thing, it, the thing that we have to recognize was in his struggle, John made more of his struggle than he did of his God. What you focus on will be magnified. And I want you to understand, you and I and John, we always have the opportunity to not focus on the issue at hand, but focus on the God that's bigger than it and is on the other side of the issue. I realize you, some of you are facing some incredibly difficult things, but look at me, that's not the issue. You see, that's what the Bible's called us to live a life like that. That's not a living a life by sight. 
We walk by what we see, but the Bible tells us we have to walk by what we know. We have to walk by what our faith tells us. Even when your tail's on the line. And we got we to gotta see that. So John recognized who Jesus was. And John said, no, 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 no. And Jesus said, yeah. And so, so an un, and another thing that makes that issue that John turned away, that John wanted to ask Jesus, what's up? John was standing there. John saw the Holy Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and lighting on Jesus. And John himself heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. And with him I am well pleased. John had every reason in the world to trust and believe. We have to see those things because every one of us are going to have this. This is the temptation you're going to face tomorrow, the next day. Every one of us faces daily. Am I going to focus on what I see, the troubles at hand, or am I going to focus on my father that's on the other side? So that's, that's it. That's the call of life for you and I. And John understood this at this point in his life. So John baptizes Jesus. He hears this voice from heaven, and this is the description that we get in the book of Matthew. The next description that we get, is, it's the same description just given to us by another guy is in Mark chapter 1. I want you to see this. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. At that time, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. And the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven. You are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. At once the spirit, look at this. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. This verse is the verse that made me feel sure that this is the message that I was supposed to preach to you and to you and to myself today. Jesus dealt with his baptism and immediately God sent him into the wilderness. And he was tempted by Satan in every possible way. See, what you and I do is what, what we tend to do is we tend to go, man, I know I got this little private place in my mind and I know I've got these struggles that I don't want anybody else in the world to know I deal with and I just deal with them and so what we do is is in that secret place in our minds and our hearts we we sort of come into a marriage with these things these these whether it's a sin or whatever it is I've got this thing inside my life I've got this thing that I do I've got these these thoughts that I think I've got this this stuff that I look at I've got these things that I do and we keep it so private it and we keep it so locked up and we have married those things and so we carry them with us everywhere and the reason that I believe we do that is because I don't believe we understand fully the concept of baptism Jesus understood it and so something profound happened let me let me say it this pointed to you I struggle greatly I, I, uh, I, I've been in the Baptist church. I grew up a Baptist. Uh, love it. Everything about it. Love them. But the thing that I grew up with that I struggle so greatly with that I want to try to shed some light on, you, on to today so that you can see is in my growing up, I was always taught that baptism is a public profession of faith. That you are showing everyone else what you've already on the outside, what you've done on the inside. I struggle with that concept because I believe it's bigger than that. I believe that the baptism waters are bigger than that. And I believe that that's what Jesus experienced. And so the father saw that after Jesus had dealt with this, obviously Jesus wasn't dealing with sin. He he. It was confront. He was confronted with it. He was tempted, but he never sinned. He lived a perfect life, which is the one most important thing that you and I should celebrate because he did that 
it opened up the door for you and I to know him as our Savior. So we know that it wasn't a matter of, of sin that Jesus did this, but it was a matter of you and I. He was baptized to be our example. And it's, and it's just, it's just uh, not coincidental that immediately after his baptism, he was sent out into the wilderness. Now stay with me. There's a lot we're looking at here. So keep going with me. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. When all of the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. As he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And then in, verse, in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, G John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one that I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. John is saying, even though John knew Jesus when they were in the womb, when he grew and he went into life, until this encounter with Jesus, he hadn't been, he hadn't known him. He hadn't been with him. And yet he sees Jesus coming and he knew who Jesus was. And John was uncomfortable at his role of baptizing Jesus. And so Jesus told John, no, 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 this is the way it's going to go down. And so this is what we're going to do. Now listen, I'm telling you all of those things for this reason. Look, those passages, now we're about to get, we're about to go a little deeper, so stay with me. Those passages are the passages from Scripture that, demonst or that, that, that show us what happened when Jesus was baptized. Now stay with me. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 says this, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, of the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is Jesus' great commission to his disciples, which I firmly believe is still in place, is still the great commission for you and I. This is what God has, look, we treat this, now I don't mean to get all preacher-like on you, but we treat this like it's a good suggestion and not the great commission. We treat this, we want to dissect it and chop it up into pieces that make it comfortable for us to get, comfortable for us to be able to live with somehow, but the reality is we've dissected it and diluted it so much that we have caused it to lose its power. Because there's three things that Jesus told the disciples and us to go do. Go, make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them you got to break those things down and look at them. When you make a disciple, what you do in making a disciple is you call someone. When Jesus was calling his, his disciples, they were fishermen. A bunch of them were fishermen. And he went and stood on the side of the lake and he watched them. I think they were probably a little bit clumsy fishermen. So he's watching these guys fumble around. These guys, if you look at Andrew, if you look at some of these, or the, or the, the disciples, the first ones that he called, these guys were, these guys were living up with their dad still. These guys were, had been rejected by most of society. Most of the people, by the time they were these guys' age, they were already 
doing whatever it is they were going to do. They already had a rabbi. They already had somebody that they were following. And, and so whenever you make a disciple, the process that goes on there is there has to first be a teacher that steps up and says, come follow my way of life. I want to teach you how I live, and I want you to follow it. And so what has to happen in making a disciple is there has to be a teacher and a calling to a student. The student has to agree to follow the teacher. That is what salvation is. Listen to me. You don't have to have a great understanding about, the, about any of the biblical concepts and the, 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 the great depths of scriptures. You don't have to understand how to be able to exegete the passages and all this other crazy whatever it means, wacko talk. This is what you've got to know and understand. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, not for anything that he had done. He died on the cross for what you and I had done. And after he died on the cross, the Bible says that the earth shook and that rocks split. And the tombs of many people that had died were broke open. And those people came out of their tombs and walked upon the earth. Who's teaching, who's talking about that stuff? Jesus died on the cross and was put into the grave. And three days later, he walked back out. He beat sin. He beat death. He did it all. And listen to me, church. Listen to me. You've got to understand this. He did that. The righteous paid the price for the unrighteous so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. So important for you to understand this first part, this being a disciple. It is a matter of a teacher calling a student and the student saying yes. If you have said yes to Jesus, if you have prayed and asked Jesus to come and live in your heart and be your Savior and take you to heaven when you die, if you have done that, you are going to go to heaven when you die. Nothing's going to change that. That's not going to change. You have said yes to being his disciple. He called you. He's the teacher. He called you the student, and you've said yes, and you're following him. The next thing that Jesus tells us he wants us to do then, make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them. We've lost that. And the reason we've lost that is because we don't understand what the concept of baptism is. Jesus is giving us that understanding here in Matthew chapter 28. Now I want you to look at Mark chapter 1. Because you have to understand the differences in Scripture. When you see baptism, you've got to begin to start putting some understanding to what you're reading. Mark Mark chapter 1 verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching, look church, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. This is John's baptism. John's baptism was a baptism for the repentance, for repentance, for removal of sin. John, they were baptized for repentance, for the forgiveness of their sins. That church, listen to me, don't miss this. That is not what this is. This baptism that we do here is not John's baptism. No one that gets in this water is going to be saved by this water. This is a different baptism, and we have to start putting some understanding to it, and we also have to start removing some of the dissections that we've done with the Scriptures. Stay with me. I'll show you. Mark chapter 16. The thing that we have to understand about Mark chapter 16, you have to be somewhat careful with Mark chapter 16. Do I believe it's Scripture? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's there. But you know, if you'll look even in your Bibles, 
If you'll look at your Bible at the bottom of the page, you'll see where, where however it's written in your Bible, you're going to see where Mark chapter 16, the end part of that, wasn't in the earliest transcripts. And the reason it's marked and noted like that is because the authors of, uh, the authors of the scriptures that we have wanted us to understand, hey, this passage wasn't in the early parts. We don't really see where it makes any difference any variance, we believe this is part of it, but we just want to put this note there so that you can understand. And so it would be incredibly wrong, it would be a huge mistake of us to build the doctrine on that passage of Scripture alone. But see what it says. Mark chapter 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That is a perfectly in line with everything that we believe passage of scripture not because it says whoever believes and is baptized but look how it ends whoever does not believe will be condemned please don't miss this part listen if you have not accepted Jesus Christ in your heart as your Savior, you are playing with fire. You are not guaranteed a tomorrow. None of you. I hope and pray that we all have a tomorrow. But you are not guaranteed tomorrow. If you've never said yes to Jesus, you need to do that today. Do not leave this building until you open up your mouth and confess, open up your heart and believe and accept him as your savior. Father, I want you to live in my heart. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Come and live in my life. Be my savior. Take me to heaven when I die. Do not leave this building until you've prayed that prayer most important thing you'll ever do in your life and that please don't miss this that and that alone is what separates those that go to heaven for eternity and those that don't it doesn't have to do with the baptism waters it has to do with believing those and it says whoever does not believe will be condemned if you do not believe if you do not accept Jesus Christ I, I, I want to stand before God with my with my conscience clear if you leave not just today this building if you leave this life and you never say yes to Jesus you never open your heart up to him listen to me church you will be eternally condemned you will not go to heaven. There is no other way. I don't care if it's not politically correct. I don't care if it upsets anybody else in the world. There is no other way to God except Jesus Christ. The one and only way to the Father is through the Son. You've got to have that understanding. And that's exactly what Mark 16, 16 is saying. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. This is where another distinction that we have to understand about baptism. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. That's what happens when you say yes to Jesus Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ in your heart as your Savior, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into God, into Jesus. That and that alone is what will send you to heaven. You can't get to heaven without Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one, no one gets to the Father except through me. That's it. You gotta nail that. You gotta know that. And that's the, the, the people ask me all the time, hey, we're gonna get married. Will you do marriage counseling? Sure, I'll do marriage counseling with you. All I can do is sit down and tell you the stupid things I've done and encourage you to not do them. But 
Yeah, but here's what I know that I know that I know that I know I have to do with every person that I'm ever going to marry. I make that man look her in the eyes in front of me and tell her, I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I have accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I make him tell her that. And then I make her, you look him in the eye and you tell him that you know you, that you know that you know you've accepted Jesus, that if you die someday, when you die someday, you're going to go to heaven when they can look at each other in the eyes and say that and do that and know that that is what makes them equally yoked that is that and that alone is the provision for that marriage to move into the promised land and I won't marry anyone that can't look at each other and say that have I before yes and I won't do it again that's that's important that's huge. That is this baptism that 1 Corinthians is talking about, being baptized into Christ. It's funny, if you look in the, in the Greek dictionary of the New Testament, you will see five different words for baptize. Bab, I'm not even going to try. Baptizo, baptisma, baptismos, bapto. Here's what they mean. Baptizer, to make whelmed, to make whelmed. Fully wet, immersed is what it means. It says that, that one, of them, one of them means baptized, one of them means washing. Bab, babto means to cover wholly with fluid. That's exactly the word in the Greek that the original translation is used whenever it describes what the Holy Spirit does to you and I. The Holy Spirit, when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus, into the body of Christ. That's, that's what our first baptism is. Accepting Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians is talking about. Now, now, stay with me. This is where, these next two verses is where a whole lot of stuff starts coming unraveled. And don't worry, it doesn't have to unravel. It's all good. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is probably the most controversial verse about baptism in the scriptures. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. If you go back and you look at this passage in Acts chapter 3, I mean Acts chapter 2 here, verse 38, these people have come to Peter and, I mean, Peter just has laid down, I mean, he has dropped it on them. He has laid down the law and he has got them all going, oh my gosh, they, they've come before him. These are the people, the very people that have crucified Jesus and they come before him and they're like, hey, I think we might have messed up. And Peter's going, oh, you did mess up. But your mess up was the right thing to happen because it provided all of us the right, the ability to become what God wanted us to become. Peter is explaining to them what they need to do and they all say, okay, so here's what their question is to Peter. So what must we do to be saved? And Peter's, this is Peter's answer to them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. This passage of scripture, this is why it's so controversial. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will be saved. And so people have built a doctrine around that and they say, well, if you're not baptized, you can't be saved. Listen to me. That's incorrect. That's not a correct statement. And, and what I just said to you is right. Right. But because that's not a correct statement, what we have done is we have chopped it up into pieces and we've said, well, you, you know, you get baptized, that's all well and good. So all this has got to be, all these waters are is just a public profession of our faith. All these waters are, these waters don't save us. They're just telling people on the outside what change has happened on the inside. And what I want to say to you is this, incorrect. That's incorrect. 
Nowhere will you find in Scripture that Jesus dissected these things. Here's what he told us in the Great Commission. Go make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them. Nowhere will you find in the Scriptures, you don't just do this part and you're okay. But that's what we've shrunk it down to because that's what we feel like we need to pacify ourselves. It's wrong. Hear me. You do just have to pray and accept Jesus Christ in your heart, and you will go to heaven. I don't want you to be confused. You will. But look at me. Are you walking out your life God's way? No. Are you living life the way God told you to? No. So therefore, don't expect to walk in the things that God has for you if you don't want to walk the way God told you to walk. Baptism, church is a concept that we've got to get and understand. Baptism is a part of our destiny. It's not a good suggestion. It's what God told us to do. This is what you do. But it's not the baptism waters that bring salvation. You can't make a, a doctrine, build a doctrine around this passage that says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It's not the baptism part that saves you there. It's the repentance part that saves you there. It's when you are walking in a life, uh, you're living a life, and you come to a point where you recognize, I am in trouble without Jesus. I need a Savior. And you turn away from that life, and you go, Father, come save me. I want, I want you to live in my heart. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. When you do that, you have repented and turned to God. That is what saves you. Can you, listen. Can you repent? Can you get saved and turn to God and then go to heaven when you die? Look, yes. Can you go to heaven? Can you live the rest of your life? Don't miss this. Can you live the rest of your life the way God wants you to? No. You cannot walk in his plan for you unless you walk in his plan for you. You just can't. It just doesn't work. The next passage, look, Matthew, I mean, Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him uh, the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. That's what it's supposed to look like. When we get saved, when we get saved and we accept Jesus, we're supposed to turn away from our old ways of life. And it's supposed to be something that we immediately start doing. When we get saved, it's supposed to make life look different. We're not supposed to live life like everybody else. And we're supposed to begin to live it his way. And we should follow this eunuch's example. When we accept Christ, and that's what had just happened. This eunuch had just accepted Christ. Philip was there with him. He had just accepted Christ, and he, he gets that, and he understands it now. And, and Philip said, the next thing you're supposed to do is be baptized. And they're cruising down the road, and he goes, well, dude, there's some water right there. Why can't I just do it right now? And Philip said, I guess you can. Let's go. They go down in the water, bring him back up. Baptized him. That baptism is not what sent that eunuch to heaven when he died. It was the salvation. It was the accepting Jesus Christ as his Savior that sent him to heaven. But it was that baptism that he did immediately after that caused him to be able to walk the way God wanted him to walk. Stay with me. It's going to make sense. Hopefully it's already some, but stay with me. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. This is another example of what it should look like. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You see that? It's not difficult. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, look, it's in the middle of the night. And my question to me and you is, when does Jesus jack you up like that? I mean, man, he's, we accept into this 
frail, weak body, the king of kings, the power of power, the author of everything. He comes and lives inside of us. It should cause some change. It should cause some change. It says, they spoke the word of the Lord to them and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Look, then immediately he and his whole household were baptized. They got saved and they, look. Now, now I want to close the door on condemnation. Stay with me till the end. If you, ha if you didn't do it like this, do not walk in condemnation. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Jesus Christ. If you feel condemned right now, what you need to do right now is rebuke Satan, shut him up, don't let him speak to you anymore, and finish hearing the truth. Don't be condemned. But this cat gets saved, this jailer gets saved, just had this incredible experience, and he's like, holy mackerel, you guys, something's crazy, you guys got the real deal. Whatever you got, I want. And so they're like, cool. And they go tell him about Jesus. And he says, take me home. I want, I want my family to hear. They go home in the middle of the night. The jailer that was inflicting the wounds in the first place is now cleaning the wounds up. And the whole jailer's whole family hears about Jesus. And they immediately, he says, they go to get baptized. You see, they didn't dissect it down. Here, you just get saved and then you can wait. Then sometime you get baptized. Wait. They didn't dissect it down. Neither should we. It says immediately he and his whole household were baptized. Now, look at Romans chapter 6. Hang with me. I'm almost done. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Stay with me. Look at this. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through, through the glory of the Father, we too, this is me and you, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in his death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self with him that, that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. It's like when we don't understand the concept of baptism, it's like we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but what we do before we really bury the old man, it's like we open up a suitcase and we pack some of the old man into the suitcase. We close it shut. And it's like one of those fancy suitcases that got wheels and we want to roll it around with us through the rest of life. Oh, I got Jesus. I'm new. I'm saved. I'm clean. I'm whole. I'm the righteousness of God. But every once in a while, we want to pack, unpack that suitcase and dabble back into the old ways. Listen to me. Baptism is how we bury those old things. Baptism is not what takes you to heaven, but baptized is what severs the ties between you and the old man. And we need to step into those waters with a level of understanding about what happens. And here's what I'm saying to you. I, I didn't understand why I was supposed to preach this message. I do know that in a couple of weeks I'm going to start a, a, a short series on soul ties. And I'm going to tell you, it's the scariest messages I've ever, I've ever preached. Scary for me. Scary about what's going to happen. And I, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know what we're supposed to do. And I just didn't know that we needed to prepare some things beforehand. And so when I got back and was studying about what I was supposed to preach today, Jesus, I felt like God said, I want you to preach on baptism. And I want you to have a baptism before you preach on these soul ties. So what I'm saying to you is this. We need to get a healthy understanding of what baptism is so that we can walk in it so that it will open up, it will provide a doorway of opportunity for us to start walking in our destiny. There are a lot of people in this room that maybe you may have been saved for 60 years. Awesome, I celebrate that with you. But if you didn't follow him in baptism the way the scriptures say, listen to me. It's time to nail that down. And this is what I heard the Lord say. I want you to offer a baptism next Sunday 
only for adults. Because one of the things that the church has done in, in making those dissections there, we'll get saved and then we'll kind of deal with this stuff later, is we've also kind of shrunk baptism down a lot of times into a cute thing that kids do. Because maybe we have a baptism at a swimming pool and we have 20 kids get baptized. And, and you, you, you know, we know that's more than just a cute thing. That's a powerful thing. But maybe we haven't had this level of understanding as we go into it. So I have a sheet of paper that I'm going to put on the back back there, not just yet, but here in a minute. And it's a sign-up sheet for adult baptisms. Because as I was praying about this, I felt like the Lord said, oh, man, there's a whole lot of people that I've got a big plan for, but I need them to walk it out my way. So next Sunday, we're going to offer a, ba- a, a baptism solely for adults. And if you've never followed the Lord in this, if you haven't walked in this, and, and you haven't had this level of understanding, maybe you've been baptized before. If you've been baptized before, hear me clearly. You don't need to be baptized again. But maybe something inside you says, I do, because I didn't do it with a level of understanding. I need to know what I'm doing. Wherever you are, if that's you, we want to take care of this next week. We want to set the stage. We want to be able to come before the Lord and have things set up so that he can really do some work on us. Because I believe over the next few weeks, the Lord's going to do some really powerful things in our lives, if we'll let him. That's what this is about. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Look. When we got saved, when we get baptized into Christ, we have clothed ourselves with him. And when we bury ourselves in that water and we follow him in those baptism waters, what we are doing is letting go of the suitcase of the old man. And we're saying, hey, I, I, I know this is what I've done. I know, that, I know that this stuff has always been a part of my life and I struggle with letting it go. But that's how we let it go. That's where we get the power and the authority from the king of kings to let those things go. And we bury the old and we come out to walk in the newness of life. That's what it's about. But I want you to be clear on a few of these things. I want you to know and understand. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Don't be confused on it. I want you to go into that, into the baptism waters, understanding it. And this is the one verse that I struggle with the most. Please hear it rightly. But I just, I I struggle with this whenever I talk to adults about the whole baptism issue. Listen, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33 says this. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. You cannot accept Christ and then be disowned. I do not want you to be confused and feel like, well, if I got saved and I don't do the baptism thing, is he going to disown me? I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. If I say this, I I get it, it's a big deal. But look, if that is a matter of, uh, I'm just uncomfortable because I don't don't know what people are going to think about me. That verse bothers me. That verse is talking about denying and accepting Christ. And if you've accepted him, you can't deny him. But I still struggle with why not follow him? Why not do it his way? I I struggle with that. If that's something that you and I can sit down and talk about and pray about, I would be glad to pray about it with you. I just want you to know and understand that salvation and doing things God's way, it's a big deal. I think he knew what he was doing when he set it up, and I think he wanted us to walk in his power. And I think that a lot of us surrender walking in the, in the things that God has for us because we simply don't do it his way. And some of us don't do it his way, not, not because we're, we're trying to be hard-headed or stubborn, just some of us don't, don't see it that way. Look, I, if that's you, I, that's awesome. Let's sit down, let's just talk about it together. 
But if that's something that you need to do, then that's what we want to provide you for next week. The last thing I want, last little note I want to give you, I am putting out this sign up for Nicaragua today. If you are planning on going to Nicaragua with us, this is, I, I get that this is a hard thing, but this is just the way we got to do it. We're going to buy our tickets, our airplane tickets for Nicaragua in two weeks. So if you sign this sheet today to go to Nicaragua, in two weeks from today, you have to have a $250 deposit due. I know that's expensive and I know it's a lot. Trust me, I understand it. I, I have typed up letters that we can send out for, for my family, that we can send out uh, fundraising letters, and my kids got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of stuff that we got to do, and you may have to do that too. But this is it. So in two weeks, we're, or, uh, we're going to buy our tickets. I'm putting these out today. If you're going to go, you just know Then two weeks, $250 deposits due. And then one month after that, April 6th, the full price of your airplane ticket will be due, Okay. April the 6th, your airplane ticket will be due. And if you sign up and you, we buy you a ticket, that part, that's not going to be a refundable part. You just need to know about that, okay? So these, all these sign-up sheets will be in the back, back here in the fellowship hall. If you want to grab one of those, sign one of those, do any of these things, then let us do that. Uh, would you stand with me? I'm just going to ask the elders and the relay pastors to come up to the front. And everything comes alive. I'm